Distinguished guests, ladies and gentlemen, assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. I'm really honored to be moderating our final panel for the day, featuring some of the foremost leaders in the UAE's healthcare sector on the way forward for accessible and affordable vaccine policies and response. And so, uh, it's an honor to have you with us, uh, Dr. Farid al Husseini. If I can start with you, of course, you were very much the public face of the UAE government's outstanding response to the COVID-19 pandemic. And as many of us, of course, remember, but of course, policy and response design behind the scenes is what's actually critical to the success of the UAE strategy to deal with the pandemic. And so I'd love for you to talk to us about the policies and standards framework that has been established to deal with infectious diseases and public health here in the UAE and how those have evolved with the onset of the pandemic as well. Thank you for this question. And uh, I would like to start uh, my speech by saying that uh, we know that vaccine is one of the most effective strategies in the control of uh, infectious diseases. Historically, it had played a major role in uh, preventing death. Uh, and also saving lives. Uh, we, reach, we couldn't reach polio elimination without having an effective vaccine. However, the, how we are implementing the vaccine is a major uh, pillar of uh, reach and access uh, to the patients. Uh, I think uh, COVID-19 pandemic was transformational, not only on the way we deliver the vaccines, but also in the regulations that are related to the vaccines. So far, more than 13 billion doses of COVID-19 vaccine have been distributed globally, which is tremendous numbers. However, the unfortunate thing about it is that around two thirds of the world received that later, mm. not in the right time, it was delayed. We were fortunate in UAE to be one of the first countries to have the vaccine and to start administering that. And we could uh, reach uh, really a very good coverage with the first three months after the implementation. I remember by end of February 2021, we've covered more than 50% of our target population which is something that uh, really tremendous in terms of the achievement. However, regulation is really a major cornerstone for that. Uh, how adaptive our regulation are, and also how we can do an informed decision, how we can decide on our target population. Uh, uh, we used a lot of data in the decision-making process, uh, defining our uh, target population, monitoring the progress, uh, also the quality of the services provided, Part, uh, important part of our program was also monitoring adverse events and the quality of the vaccines that we are providing to the population. So having all of those elements, I think they are very critical in terms of the uh, high quality vaccination programs in the country. And we believe that, uh, strongly believe that uh, success of one country is not enough. We need to collectively work together as a global community to perform better in terms of the vaccine. And uh, I think post-COVID, talking post-COVID, I think the focus on how to bring back the trust on the vaccination, community trust is a big factor. And this we cannot achieve without working together as a healthcare community to ensure that we uh, reach the patients, understand their concerns and address it. Trust okay. is truly everything, as you say, because, you know, the, if COVID showed us nothing else, it's like we have to work together on it. And we all have to be, you know, in that space of, of trusting and understanding that this is important for all of us. But how was the COVID-19 vaccine model? How was that different from routine vaccines that we get every day, the flu vaccine? I think the, the scale and the time are different. Yeah. The scale in terms uh, uh, that we are covering the whole population in, in the same time. 
uh, most of our vaccines are covering specific group of the population. So the scale of the operations that you need as healthcare providers in terms of planning, resources, time management, it's really a ma matter. The other part is the time factor, which means that we need the agility factor. Mm. We need to be adaptive, quick, and uh, defining our targets and milestones very precisely to be able to reach our target. So I think those are two critical elements. The third element was the model of care delivery, the access uh, to patients. Uh, previously, mostly we were depending on uh, uh, patients coming to the facilities. In the uh, model of COVID vaccine, we had to reach the patients wherever they are. And this really transform the way we are delivering the care. Talking post-COVID, I think we are not going back. Yeah. We are moving forward with the lessons learned from COVID. So, so if we want to reach patients, we need to be uh, flexible in the way we are delivering those services. And we need also our regulations to be flexible to adapt those emerging uh, services and emerging technologies that can support patients and empower them to make the right decision. And that brings us perfectly to Ustaz Ahmed and your role here in terms of reaching patients where they are. You know, as the UAE's leading healthcare supply chain, how has Rafid revolutionized UAE healthcare procurement while ensuring supply chain security and quality? Thank you. Uh, glad to be here today. And uh, I think the questions can, I can divide it into two answers. One is regarding being a revolutionary and the second is regarding the quality and the safety. So uh, Rafid by itself, it's, as a GPO, it is a revolution. It is a new way of thinking in UAE on the way what we provide today. We consolidate the procurement. We provide uh, supply chain and the procurement services. And that's our core business. While the the previous model it was that the procurement and the supply chain being part of the hospital, the hospital's core service is patient care. It's not about developing the supply chain and uh, warehousing and so on, because the priority goes to patient and the doctors and the nurses. While now, Rafid by itself, it's, uh, we focus on procurement, we focus on supply chain, and that's why we consolidate, we bring it all under one roof. And in relation to uh, safety and security of the, whether the vaccine, whether the medication, despite Rafid being just two years old now, but uh, our experience comes from Saha and other healthcare sectors. It's beyond 20 years experience. We've been handling vaccines, we've been handling narcotics, uh, and many other products and medications in different kind of uh, environments. So, plus, this combined with highly certified and experienced procurement professionals. So all of that together, the team which is working today, that's a new, uh, it hasn't been before available in, in UAE. And Rafid proved itself during the pandemic, working very closely shoulder to shoulder with, uh, under the leadership of DOH, uh, other partners, um, not only supplying the vaccines, supplying the vaccines, the COVID medication, uh, maybe Sotrovimab, one, one of the first COVID medication that was supplied, with the, we worked with the DOH on that, to supply the first country in the world. And it was even, the supply chain was so quick that eight hours after landing the, the flight, the first patient was infusion. So it shows how resilient the system was. And that's why, uh, with the support of the leadership, and their belief in, in that the team here on the ground can deliver. We were on the safety index, like the most resilient city in the world. So that's where Rafid changed revolution and how we also uh, make sure that all the medications, vaccines and uh, consumables is handled in a safe and secure environment.
It, it, game changing, truly game changing. And so I'd like to bring you into this, uh, Muhammad, and to, to hear your thoughts around, uh, Dr. Farida alluded earlier about regulation and the importance of being able to trust the vaccine. So I'd love to get your thoughts on that, your thoughts on the importance of, of regulation in the development of vaccines and how we should be rethinking health security post-COVID-19. Thank you. I mean, uh, as Dr. Farida highlighted, when the pandemic arose, I mean, there was uh, not much options available to, I mean, uh, go against either weight or go a bit uh, more deep on what are the possible options that uh, we have in hand uh, in order to fight that pandemic. And then uh, one of those options was, I mean, uh, the early access, uh, I mean, to vaccination. Uh, early diagnosis, and this goes to, I mean, uh, the R&D and the clinical development. And here the story begins that we are, I mean, from infrastructure perspective, we've been able to conduct, I mean, uh, one of the mega clinical trials, I mean, available in the region. And we've been able to provide access to, I mean, um, subjects and people across the country early on. And it is the time now to do one line, take a snapshot, and see what are the lessons learned, I mean, uh, part of the success uh, of this journey. Uh, one of them is moving after COVID that we are able now from infrastructure perspective to go more into R&D clinical development strategically. Uh, the country have drafted the clear regulations, I mean, um, uh, across the guidelines for treatment of the COVID along, I mean, the journey and keep on updating uh, uh, those guidelines with the all available medication, both of the development and the clinical trials globally. Um, on the other side, which is more important, uh, after COVID, there are some lessons learned that go for manufacturing as well. And now uh, we have seen lots of uh, country development in terms of manufacturing and transfer a full technology to the country, being able to uh, ready for the next pandemic or for the next uh, surge. Yeah, exactly, exactly being ready for the next one, because, you know, now it's, it's just, it's on the mind. We have to be ready for whatever is coming next. And so, um, Dr. Farida, did we have a, a, a lack of, of access? Did we have issues uh, concerning a, a lack of vaccines during the COVID-19 as compared with other countries? I know other countries did have that, but when you compare uh, uh, across the board, how, how was our access compared to theirs? Uh, I think uh, yeah, UAE has been considered one of the champions for mm. the vaccination mm. coverage because we were uh, really uh, up to um, the highest expectation of the government. They set a very tough target, to be honest. Uh, the way we could reach a better access by mixing between different vaccines. And I think uh, mixing of the vaccines was important uh, because uh, first we have uh, multiple relationships by Lateral relationship with different countries, we could access different vaccines at the same time. So this improved the numbers of the doses we have in the beginning. The other thing is we are, uh, uh, our population is really multidisciplinary, having different backgrounds, different nationalities. So people were affected by the thinking and the ideas in their own country of origin. Some people wanted X or Y vaccine. So having uh, more than one option and uh, giving the patient the right to decide, I think this even improved the access to the vaccination in a way that they could uh, get what they want, not only what we, they, we c could afford in terms of providing the vaccine. So those are important factors. Uh, globally, the access have been a huge issue until now, there is a big issue with the access to vaccination because of the pricing as well. I think the UAE government defined the strategy in a way that they said in the beginning, the medications and the food are red line, so the government is taking care of that regardless of what is the cost or what are the implications of that. So here our strategy was to ensure that everyone gets the access. The most vulnerable population, 
and all other population, including uh, residents, including labor workers who might not even have the time to go to the clinic. So we had to have a dedicated teams reaching this specific population to their uh, places of working or places of living. Elderly, for example, they were scared of getting the vaccines uh, uh, in the hospital because of the number of cases. So we had to design uh, the access for the vaccines based on the needs and uh, the concerns that each target population had. Mm -hmm. We also moved very proactively in a way that we could find who are the high risk population being uh, the having the uh, hospital information system that is centralized and we try to call them so we reach them before they come to us as well to ensure that we are covering the most vulnerable population uh, in the beginning of the campaign. So I think there are many ways uh, that worked in parallel to ensure that we have a high quality vaccination program and also high uh, access to the vaccination by different groups of our population. You certainly have to be innovative in that regard and so I'll come back to you Ahmed and ask about the game-changing strategies that are being implemented to overcome the challenges of distribution within the healthcare sector while still supporting uh, the procurement needs. Okay, uh, a good question. This, uh, when it comes to our how Rafid is changing the game today. Let's look back, for example, uh, just before COVID and after COVID, after this uh, the panic about the vaccines and what was happening. So today we have, we didn't have any capabilities for storage of the vaccines, for example. Day one, we were searching for just 10 million, location for 10 million vaccines. Where are we going to keep it? Today, we have the capabilities to uh, store more than uh, uh, one, 200 million vaccines. We have the capability, but if you go around, it can go to billions. And capabilities of the storage, minus 80, minus 20, that nothing was available on that level. Uh, looking at uh, today we have capabilities from the manufacturing, uh, PPEs, manufacturing of uh, uh, even the fill and finish line. Almost the, uh, with the G42, the factory is always there, one of the biggest in the region. So this all was not available uh, before COVID. And Rafid is one of the things that came out to change that. Uh, we, by consolidating, the forecasting, planning across the healthcare facilities, including governmental entities. That's changed the way uh, that sup supply chain and the procurement is handled by uh, how it used to be. And that's where today we believe that uh, integrating with other systems and integrating other entities with, the, for example, let's look at uh, uh, Malafi, uh, Maman, and other insur insurance companies uh, integrating with all these systems. This will build up to Rafa that we can utilize and instead of uh, and instead of inventing the, like, the wheel or reinventing the wheel, we can you just hold on these systems, integrate with them, build up on it where we can come up with the solutions to healthcare supply chain. And that's what we do. That's where we always approach the entities with the solutions. And that's the game changing today as not just to uh, be uh, real, being, being proactive and uh, going to the government or the other market, uh, entities in the market with the, where we can change the game today. Yeah, absolutely. And so, uh, Mohammed, I want to ask you about the challenges that you see in particular around access and affordability for vaccines from your perspective. It's really important to, to differentiate between commercially uh, access to commercially available vaccines versus, I mean, uh, early in development vaccines, because this is something very important. Commercially access, uh, accessible vaccines, I mean, um, it's, uh, the government have done a great job uh, across of the mandatory vaccination for pediatric 
of uh, the COVID time or the optional vaccination uh, through the regulation and that fast track registration to provide those all options available and um, again worked with the uh, private insurance and insurance companies to provide the affordability. Here it remains only when it comes to optional vaccination uh, about the awareness um, and how to reach a patient level access to the vaccine. And uh, this is maybe uh, where uh, a, a lot of patient support programs have to, I mean, carry on in order to be able to provide optional vaccination to, I mean, um, all group of uh, people that need such vaccination. And it's really important to highlight the role of technology since we've highlighted the role of technology since the morning. I mean, uh, uh, about the application developed to track, I mean, who's vaccinated, who's not vaccinated, what kind of access to those, I mean, people to certain, I mean, institutional location. Uh, that go, we should not stop. We should carry on that further to go for the optional vaccination as well and for certain group of people. The second part, which is related to, I mean, the R&D vaccination, and this is where, I mean, uh, Again, there is a lot of new development coming on on the way, and uh, strategically we have to work with the, I mean, uh, pharmaceutical and the biotech companies on showing the success that the, I mean, the country has in terms of running a, an early phase clinical trials, and uh, the current reg regulatory system in terms of, I mean, uh, compliant with, the, I mean, the whole regulatory authorities and the WHO. Uh, plays a big role on convincing them that this is the right country to conduct uh, clinical trials from quality perspective, from track records uh, of what is vaccines that has been already, I mean, registered part of the WHO campaigns, from data only generated from UAE. Absolutely, Maybe yes. if I can add to this point, I mean, I can see where is the point we accomplish each other. Uh, vaccine is very important for uh, to be immune, but it, vaccine by itself it doesn't immune. I mean, doesn't give you the immunity or the uh, the cure. What you need to be to be vaccinated. So, to be vaccinated, that's what will give you the immunity, but not vaccine by itself. So. Here comes the process of moving the vaccine because whatever done in the manufacturing part and the governments and trials and so on, then comes the role, okay, everything is ready. Whereas we need to move this vaccine from uh, which was for Rafid, as Rafid it was the Rafid DC, which was used as a hub for distributing across the region uh, we, where we distributed more than 300 million vaccines to 60 countries uh, around the globe, to villages, to very remote places. So those people who needed to be vaccinated, that's where it comes at, that the final end the part, which was the supply chain and where is Rafat built it and, and delivered the vaccine to the patient, including in some situation with the nurses to vaccinate. And so uh, it was a, a huge, that kind of collaboration. Since we are living uh, FIFA now, also uh, like we, each one of us should like no one should drop the ball here. We have to carry it one by one, making sure every part, every chain here, it is monitored, tracked, and secured with quality and safety. I love, I love the analogy there. It's perfect. <laughs> it's perfect. Yeah, exactly. But, you know, talk to us about some of the technologies that are really critical here. So, you know, if I could hear from you, Ahmed and, and uh, Mohammed, on this one, yeah. Sorry? The technologies that are really critical here to make sure that this happens, to make sure that your supply chains are on track. Yes, of course, uh, the, uh, tracking this all from A to Z, of course, requires a lot of technological uh, integration among everybody. As I said previously, that we, uh, not today, forget about the COVID, the vaccine, but tomorrow and future, because COVID is over for us now. We are looking now in the future, in the economic development. Now, here comes the technology. We need to work together again and integrate in a way that uh, I would say we are looking at future. Uh, the, 
the medication should go or the vaccine should go to the patient, not the patient comes to it. Like, just to predict before. That's how the system should be resilient and strong in future. Mohammed. Yeah, I mean, uh, I will echo uh, Ahmed what said. I mean, um, part of this it could be through the technology assessment, like what we have seen in the Hessen application. I mean, uh, this was uh, something that it was a, a great initiative and it helped a lot. I mean, uh, accessing lots of, I mean, uh, people to certain institutions. And we should lay on, on the same for the technology assessment, for uh, wearables, for everything to, I mean, uh, bring the subject the vaccine, not the other way around, and being able to track mandatory vaccination and optional vaccination in the country. Dr. Farida, if I can come back to you and, and ask you in terms of what efforts have been made to elevate and uplift the UAE's healthcare sector to provide effective, preventative, and curated healthcare services in light of all of this? I think this question needs maybe days to explain. <laughs> <laughs> the, so, the most important key the point. The most yes. important, I think uh, you touched about, upon technology. Mm -hmm. I think technology was very important as well, even in the regulation side, where we had not only to integrate, but also to utilize the information that are provided, use AI technologies, learning machines to predict. So for example, we use prediction and the planning for vaccine distribution where to start first and how uh, the group that we will start impact COVID vaccine uh, incidence and prevalence, for example. So technology, use, the use of technology is really transformational to us. Mm -hmm. And I think uh, its use in the future will increase over time. So it's just about realizing how important it is and prioritizing the use of technology because there is a lot in the market, but what will really make the difference to our patients and to patients' life is really what we need to prioritize and make sure that uh, our organization have some kind of filtering process. Not everything available in the market will be useful, but we need to really uh, use the technologies to close the gaps that we have to address the challenges that we have in our organizations, in the day-to-day -day patient care, in our regulations. So uh, our government have really a really excellent use of technology in terms of addressing the challenges that we had. Uh, I think research was really transformation during COVID. It was used in a right way, aligned with the government needs and uh, strategies to ensure that it feeds on any new evidence that can help us to move on faster, move uh, uh, quicker, and in a better uh, uh, prevention uh, of the uh, disease for our patients. Uh, so the use of technology, the use of the research, and I think the big element was really the leadership commitment and support that we could even all feel, uh, not only in the leadership position, but also doctors who were delivering the services, volunteers. So really we could see how much uh, the visionary and uh, the leadership role uh, played a major in terms of the planning, in terms of being present with us monitoring what's happening and really reacting very fast in a way that could help us move in a faster way i feel like it's it's two things it's having that you know awareness of you know the the people the end users the patients but also harnessing the power of data and exactly. making sure that we really use that to the best effect. Mohammed, I, I want to come to you and ask you about the role of CROs, uh, contract research organizations, in paving the way for strategizing the way forward for the UAE market. Yeah, I mean, that's a very important question. It might go for long, but I will try to brief. Uh, CROs is like the front line working on behalf of uh, pharmaceutical and biotech companies. And uh, the ultimate objective is to provide uh, subject and patients an early access to new treatment. Unless this is uh, as highlighted by colleagues, I mean, it's for uh, a strategic allocation on rare disease or gene therapy, that part of population that is very unique. Uh, the whole pharmaceutical companies and biotech tends to um, allocate the trials on operational model where time, cost, and quality are the main driver, I mean, for their selection of the country who's gonna run the clinical trial. 
And here, the CEO's will become like, I mean, showing the, uh, the best case scenarios that we have in the country, work with healthcare providers and institutions, hospitals, to put an operational model that is workable on an efficient cost perspective in order to be at, able to attract new development to the country. And that is our ultimate objective at the end. Fantastic. We have run out of time, but if there are any questions from the audience, we would love to take them. So if you have a question, would you put, yep, there's a gentleman over here. Assalamu alaikum, Thamr al Mahid. Are we going to see the vaccination uh, manufacturing localization in uh, UAE? And if you are going to see it, uh, what's the time span for it? Yes, please. Thank you for your question, and it's very important. Yes, um, it's not we are going to see in the future, but we already started to have manufacturing plants in UAE. Uh, we started with the Sinopharm uh, vaccine. There are uh, also uh, many uh, agreements that have been signed for other vaccines to be available in terms of the manufacturing in UAE. Uh, and we believe that this is part of the overall global strategy in a way that it is uh, previously maybe limited to certain uh, co countries or certain companies, but the expansion is very important at this stage, uh, regionalization of the vaccine manufacturing, because we need the access, we need also to contribute to the innovation, uh, what are the vaccines that we need in the future. So we need to co work collectively, and uh, UAE uh, leadership have really put a lot of support to uh, expand the capacity in terms of the vaccine manufacturer, vaccine a clinical trial and researches that goes hand to hand to the vaccination as well. Thank you. Other questions from the audience? If we have any... I think we can take one more question. One last one. One more? Not right here. Yeah. <coughs> Thank you. Assalamu alaikum. And I me Charian. My name is Charian. I'm with Pure Health, and Dr. Farida, I work with a gentleman to your, to your right. Not a question, I just want to say thank you, Dr. Farida, and the entire healthcare team for helping us combat Rafid, uh, combat COVID. Because of your support, with the direction from the government, we are all here today to celebrate the uh, success of battling COVID. Thank you so much, and Sally Musa, I'm a big fan of you on LinkedIn. Thank you, Ahmed Bastaki, for your wonderful leadership to the government, to the, to the Rafa team, and to Pure Health, and also the gentleman, Mr. Mohammed. Thank you, everybody, for your presence. And four things, take care, stay safe, stay positive, test negative. Shukran Jazeerin. Salaam Alaikum. <laughs> Thank you so much for that, and uh, absolutely, we do have to say that the UAE has been exemplary in something that was completely unprecedented. Nobody in the, in the world had seen something like this in recent memory, and yet the UAE were incredible leaders the world over, and everybody looked to the UAE for an amazing response. So thank you, Dr. Farida, and to the whole team. And I think if the, the panel showed us anything today, if one part of the puzzle is missing, none of it works. So thank you to all of our guests today for showing us how it all works together in such a brilliant way. Thank you so much, Dr. Farida, Ahmed al-Bastaki, and Muhammad Mustafa. Thank you, ladies and gentlemen.